Uh, so welcome to the first uh, EDI speaker series here at GPS. Um, today, we're very happy to have two uh, great speakers uh, for our theme. Uh, first speaker will be uh, Professor Myra Serrano from the University of Puerto Rico. And then the other, the second speaker will be Professor Fernando uh, Tormas Aponte from University of Maryland. Uh, they're both political scientists uh, and they are the founding uh, founders and directors of the Minority Graduate Placement Program. Um, this is a program that places uh, students from underrepresented backgrounds in graduate political science programs in the U.S. Um, and the program participants enroll in methods training camp, uh, something that we, we also like to do here at UCSD, uh, attend graduate school application workshops and receive financial support to conduct research under the supervision of faculty member uh, and to visit graduate political science department. So, um, I think they're going to talk about their excellent work. Um, and uh, as a reminder, this session will be recorded uh, by Zoom. And if you, we're going to have uh, plenty of time for Q&A afterward. Uh, if you have a question, feel free at any time to use the Q&A function to input your question. Uh, so the first speaker will be Myra. Myra, uh, please go ahead and welcome to GPS. Oh, you're kind of mute for some reason. I'm muted uh, right here. Now, now you're fine. Now you're fine. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again for the invitation and hi to everybody that is logged in. Um, I'm going to share here my screen. Um, I have a brief PowerPoint that I want to share with everybody. Um, so please let me know if you can see it. Is there, you can see it, right? Okay. It's good. Well, um, as, I, as you mentioned, uh, Fernando and I started this um, actually in 2019, right, Fernando, beginning in 2019, so it's a relatively new program, but we decided to work on this topic um, mostly because of our own experience as undergraduate students at University of Puerto Rico, then going to grad school at, um, in the United States and mainland, and also teaching. Um, I had the opportunity to teach in different universities in Buffalo State College, University of Buffalo, uh, before coming back to Puerto Rico. So um, a lot, I had a lot of experience with students with different backgrounds, different needs, different interests, and that motivated us to create this. And before I go ahead a little bit um, with my presentation, I do want to apologize if you hear me a little bit short of breath. I'm 38 weeks, almost 39 weeks um, in my pregnancy. So this baby is basically crushing my lungs. So I'm a little bit out of breath. <laughs> but um, so I want to talk to you a little bit of my gap. And the way that we created this presentation is that we want to share some of the things that we were observing, things that we did to address them, some things that we have learned and Fernando will take over to talk about what we can do going forward. What are the things that we can um, do as a community to increase the number of students um, in graduate school and in other areas of the academia. So our program is called MyGap. Um, it is Minority Graduate Placement Program. And we placed it in the University of Puerto Rico. And to give you a little bit of um, context of this, of our institution, um, University of Puerto Rico is a public system. It has around 58, uh, probably a little bit less now with the pandemic, 58,000 students, so it's relatively big if you compare the population of the island of 3.3 million. Um, it has 11 campuses um, with different degrees of complexity. Um, some campuses are look more like a community college, others are like um, research intensive um, um, campuses. So there's a lot of variation in terms of the, the needs that we cover within the system. Um, unfortunately, we only have two political science departments in the whole island, uh, one in the, the one that I'm teaching. And for example, it's a very popular degree. We have over 450 students, one of the most popular degrees from the social sciences. 
but we also have a lot of restraints and a lot of um, needs. We only have eight full-time professors for those 450 students um, and with four and four teaching load. So that gives us a view of the needs that students have, but also the needs that faculty have in these type of environments, um, especially in small universities that are not um, as resourceful as other ones. And, and, and not only that, we have a very popular undergraduate degree in political science, but we don't offer any type of graduate degree in political science. So any of our students that want to continue um, to do a master's or a PhD, they will have to either look into um, going to mainland or Europe, we have, or Latin America. So students are faced with the, with either the options that they have within our university or leaving the island to uh, another campus. Um, so with that in mind, um, that also tells a little bit about what happened to me or what happened to Fernando. And in my case, I knew I wanted to continue graduate school. Um, I knew I wanted to be in academia, but I had no clue how to do it. <laughs> I, and unfortunately, um, there was a lot of, um, I think the gap of knowledge from my part and also from the institution in terms of what I needed to do in order to apply for grad school or even things like financing or aid for grad school or what are the importance of research and our method training. So there was a lot of uh, information that I didn't know um, that last year, my senior year, that I had to face when I was applying to grad school. Um, and knowing this was one of the reasons why when I came back um, together with Fernando, we decided to create my gap. Um, and also one of the, another reasons that not just, you know, tell, tell my story, but also we found doing a very short survey among our students last year, for example, we surveyed students that were junior or sophomore or freshmen, and we asked them, what do you plan to do after you graduate? And 32% of them said they wanted to continue to law school. And that was, that's understandable. Our university has one of the um, largest and most um, known law school of the island. Um, but interesting, another 17% said they want to continue in um, pursuing a, some type of political science graduate program. Another 11% said they want to continue a, a master's in public administration. Another 15% said they wanted to continue another PhD program. So we see here a lot of diversity within students about what they want to do after they graduate their, their bachelor's degree. But interestingly enough, when they are in their last year, this shifts and the majority of them decides to go to law school. So we have here a leaky pipeline, pipeline in the sense that students want to do something else than law school, but because that there's no offering within Puerto Rico and maybe they have no understanding of what they have to do to do it outside of Puerto Rico, they just decide to go to law school. And this is not something that we want to have. We don't want students to just go to a program just because it's the only thing that they know or they think it's available for them. Um, so you see here that that number dropped to only 7% said it to go to a political science grad program. That's very little or to any other type of um, masters in public administration. So this is something else that made us um, uh, create my gap to encourage students to understand what are their options. And if they decide to pursue those options, give them the support that they need. Um, so one of the problems or the problems that we've also found, it was, so let's say that we found students or that decided, okay, I definitely want to go to grad school. I, this is something that I want to do. But when we sat down with the students and we tried to look in whether it were the strength in order to apply and to compete and to get into these programs, 
a lot of them had very weak research um, experiences or training for that matter. matter. Um, many of them completely lacked information about what they need to do to apply for these schools. And above all, they didn't have mentorship. They didn't have someone that they can ask these questions. Um, so these three problems or um, in context was um, something that we decided to, to address with uh, MIGA. And as you well said, you know, this was designed to place students um, and with it among the things that we do and have worked this past year until so the pandemic hit um, was we help students go to different campuses that they were interested in applying to either with some of the fundings that we got, we have a little bit of money from the uh, American Polar Science Association, or we found ways to also finance it through other mediums. We also had some um, uh, money to help students to, for example, work uh, as a research assistant with another professor. So they have that knowledge of what research entails. Um, we also host a training session of methods during the summer. That's, that was last 2019 summer. We couldn't do that this year because of the pandemic. Um, but in that summer program, we, we, and we are gonna discuss a little bit, we help students to get familiarized with different research techniques and methods. Um, we also organize a series of workshops, things as simple as how to write a curriculum vita or how to ask for a good letter of recommendation that sometimes students don't even know how to ask for them or what that entails. Um, and most importantly, we were lucky to have created a, red, a web of mentors, not only from Puerto Rico, but from all over the United States. And they have been pivotal in helping these students um, because students know that they can ask questions to them. They can uh, ask them whether what is the appropriate program for their research interest or um, ask them to review their personal statement. So that web of mentors um, that have been taking their time um, to, to work with our student has been very important. So here you see part of our first cohort. We have two cohorts so far um, and each cohort has a lot of diversity. We, don't focus just taking senior students. We have students that are sophomore, junior, and senior. And we work with each student um, depending on their needs and their different stages. So one of the things that we did, for example, was teaching them how to use in vivo for those that are interested in qualitative studies or how to use our studio for those that are more interested in quantitative studies. We did workshops about, you know, what is a research statement, how to do the research statement or the personal statement, what is the difference between those. those. Um, we have people like Dr. Carlos Ramos, who is Vice President of Academic Affairs and also member of the Leadership Alliance Board, revising their um, the personal statement. Um, we encourage them to present their research and we gave them feedback and the, that we help them how to really think about how to present a research question and how to do that famous elevator um, pitch. And um, within those two cohorts that we have so far, we have 17 students. Of those, we have been able to place five in graduate school. Um, they're right now, they're in their first year. Of those five, we have two that are at master's level and the other three are doing their PhDs. Um, of those, uh, we have four women, self-identified women. Of those four women, three are first generation student, which has been a really important accomplishment. Um, and we can talk about a little bit about those um, different um, uh, I would say uh, challenges that first gen students um, do face. We have also um, um, a male um, in the PhD. He is also a first gen student. And this year, this fall, we had six students applying to graduate school. Now we are waiting for 
the results of that. I know that several of them, a couple of them applied to UC San Diego. So let's see if some of them get in. But I think we have uh, news from Ohio State. Um, we have news from American University, from um, George Washington. So we have several news. We're still waiting what's going to happen with those six um, that apply this year. And we have another six students that are in the pipeline. And they will be applying for the next uh, round of um, application for the next fall. Um, so, so far, you know, with these 17 students that we were able to recruit and to give um, some support, we see promise. But what we have learned with, with this program, with this pilot program, um, and this is very important because I think when we started setting this program, we were thinking a lot about the workshops and thinking about the method training program in the summer and thinking about the research experience that we wanted to do. Um, but what we found that you can very well design um, a method training program or design a really good workshops, but you need to follow these with good mentorship. Um, I think here the key was mentorship because the students tend to get all this information, but for them it's really hard to kind of lock the information that they're receiving with their interests. And that's where the mentorship is fundamental um, because mentorship can help you redefine your research interest. Mentorship can help you understand what is the culture in academia. Mentorship can help you also understand that failure is common. Um, this is something that a lot of students didn't understand until they started talking with other professors or recently graduate students that are entering into the labor market that they tend to listen to this, to the success stories or to all the things that, you know, I, uh, we accomplish but they don't hear all the failures that we have between these accomplishments. So knowing that failure is common also helps them build confidence. And this is fundamental for first generation students, um, students that and they don't know anybody that is in academia, that they have parents, for example, that question why you have to continue studying for another five years and don't just get a job. Um, that they, you know, so they lack that support in their house, in their homes or within their peers and having that mentorship and having people that tells them, oh, this is what you're gonna be facing, this is common, don't worry about it, this is, think about this in the long road has been fundamental for many of these students. And something else that we also learned uh, with my gap is that students needs tend to be very specific. We, if we develop these type of programs to increase um, the number of students that come from different environments, we have to understand that even the most well-designed program has to understand that there's gonna be needs that are very specific for each student and have some type of flexibility to address these needs. Um, if this takes more time and tends to take a little bit more resources, especially for faculty members, but the difference on the success story is very, very sharp. Um, so these are the two things we have learned with, with MIGA. And we can talk a little bit later in the Q&A of other things that we have learned and, and other stuff that we have been doing for the last, this year during the pandemic. But I want to then leave Fernando to talk a little bit about what this means right within the larger uh, community um, and within the, our main goal of, of diversifying academia. Great, uh, Fernando. Uh, thank you, uh, Victor, and thank you, Maida, for, for introducing uh, these efforts and the challenges that students face, as well as some of the successes that they've experienced. Um, it's really uh, for us uh, a really a pleasure to work with these students and to, and to see them succeed. It really um, it is challenging, but it's also surprising 
to see, you know, how much talent there is there and how much can be accomplished with, with some investments in these students. Um, I want to turn our attention to a sort of broader disciplinary uh, phenomena and trends that we've been observing in the field of political science, particularly, but I think that this is relevant to other fields like public administration, public policy, uh, and across the social sciences. So about actually 10 years ago now, uh, President Diane Pinderhughes of the American Political Science Association convened a task force to try to assess what were the issues with respect to inclusion, among other issues in our field. And the way they described the pace by which we've succeeded in diversifying our field was they described it as glacial, which always stuck with me. And it's so, it's so slow. We've had such, such little progress. This was published in 2011. When you look at the numbers now, 10 years later, the pace is still glacial. And I don't wanna undermine the great progress that has been made. But when we place this in the broader context of the share of students that represent the share of their population as a social group in the United States, to me, it's just mediocre. And I think that we need to question um, our strategies, given that we have failed time and time again to make a transformative push. We've failed to make the transformative kind of progress that we should achieve and we failed to uh, change this pace from a glacial uh, pace. And I want to argue that this kind of transformative push will not come unless we embrace intentional efforts aimed at change within our field and social change more broadly. So I'll explain what I mean by that, but essentially what I'm calling for is for us to organize, for us to embrace advocacy within our field to transform it. So one of the things that, that we observe is that the history of failure demonstrates that opportunities for change will not be built for underrepresented groups. There will not be folks that will come in and will bring and will build the opportunities for change. We know due to this history of failure that underrepresented groups in academia must build their own opportunities for change and then seize them. So this is, of course, not the only battle that we should engage in, but it is an important one. And it is, for me, an inspiration to see the work of, of scholars like Alden Morris, who argued that the civil rights movement, for instance, succeeded not because of the altruism of white philanthropy and allies, but because of the efforts that Black people put forth to generate the opportunities that they needed to succeed. It was only after they had accomplished a series of successes that then they had the kind of support that people now credit for being the reason for why the civil rights movement succeeded. I think we can find a lot of inspiration in Alden Morris's work and think about how do we generate the opportunities that will, be, that will not be generated for us. And I argue that some opportunities are already there and we must seize them. So where do I locate these opportunities? I think there's been a shift, not just a societal shift, but a shift within our, our field of political science. I see the formation and strength of caucuses that are interested in the issues of marginalized, marginalized groups. So identity caucuses, diversity caucuses. I see the strength of organizations like the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. I see the strength of initiatives like Women Also Know Stuff and People of Color Also Know Stuff that are bringing more attention to the kind of knowledge that folks from underrepresented backgrounds produce and connecting them with those who disseminate these findings to the broader audience. I see strength in the creation of new journals like Politics, Groups and Identities or Journal for the Study of Race and Ethnicity and Politics. 
the changes in the editorial teams and journals that are at the top of our discipline, like the American Political Science Review or the American Journal of Political Science, organize efforts uh, for transformative change within our field, like scholars who formed the feminist mafia. And I also see strength and an opportunity in existing and ongoing efforts to, to encourage, to build a home for the study of race, ethnicity, and politics in initiatives like PREEC and SPIRE. And very importantly, I see a lot of inspiration and a model in the Ralph Bunch Institute uh, that the American Political Science Association uh, puts together. In fact, Ralph Bunch was one of the inspirations for the creation of MyGap. We see MyGap as an expansion of Ralph Bunch, and we would like to see this expansion become uh, commonplace across minority serving institutions in the United States and beyond. This is the kind of attention that we now know uh, that is successful in pushing and placing students, not just in graduate programs, but as successful faculty at the top of our field. So we have models and opportunities and resources that we can point to and seize and mobilize for this kind of transformative push. This is, these opportunities that I've mentioned are, um, again, I find inspiration in our colleagues' work. Uh, the, the work of Michael Minta and Valeria Sinclair Chapman who look at caucuses within Congress and legislatures and they, they refer to these as diversity infrastructures. I think these are the diversity infrastructures that uh, social movement resource mobilization scholars say that organize and mobilize our action, that can coordinate our action, and that these are particular uh, structures that we can strengthen because a lot of organized activity will happen under the auspices of these diversity infrastructures. So we need to continue to invest in these, but also encourage folks to embrace advocacy within our field. We need, I think, coordination across these different efforts. Um, and in order to achieve that kind of coordination, I've encouraged our field through a, a piece that I shared with you all, uh, published in, in, in PS, uh, that I call uh, intersectional solidarity, uh, which I define as an ongoing process of creating ties and coalitions across social group, social group differences uh, by negotiating power differentials. And how do I see this form of intersectional solidarity approach to organizing to change our field? I think there are a couple of things that we could do, more than a couple, things that we can do within our field to adopt that kind of approach. One of them is to recognize the ways in which intersectional forms of oppression and domination manifest themselves in academic spaces and in our own institutions. So this process of recognition is really important. I think it would allow us to then represent scholars from intersectionally marginalized groups in institutional and organizational leadership and promote and embrace their leadership. I think it could also look like prioritizing the issues of intersectionally marginalized groups in the agendas for disciplinary change and research in our fields. And I see that happening in many spaces within our field. That's why I feel, um, as Paulo Freire would say, critically hopeful. And lastly, these changes and these efforts must be funded. We need to apportion resources for these efforts. It means that we need to mobilize resources. This, this is not just, these are not just financial resources. It also uh, means time, which of course should be um, compensated, which takes me to some of the challenges. Of course, finances being one of them. There are many challenges that remain for us to really achieve this transformative push and the kind of coordination that I think would be necessary to achieve it. Those who are doing this work are extremely overburdened. I can speak for myself and for Maida uh, because this work is exhausting. It's precarious. We're, 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 we're exhausted. And this is transferred to our students. Um, we have a lot of colleagues who are in the same position, who feel overburdened to do diversity work. Uh, underrepresented groups are then burdened to do this work. And as I said, these opportunities won't be done for us. 
So I don't complain about the duty to do this work, the responsibility to do this work. But I do want to point to the fact that these folks who are doing this work are overburdened and we must invest in efforts to relieve these burdens, to redistribute these burdens. We see also a challenge in the persistence of inequality, even when folks are faced with alternatives to the ways in which things are done. And in that piece that I shared, I, I share examples of scholars who have uh, made efforts only to see colleagues uh, shut them down. Uh, and that also is exhausting. Um, I also see challenges in the gap that exists between institutions trying to give an appearance of diversity and actual substantive efforts to shift the conditions in which we work in, right? The substantive shifts. And we've seen this. In fact, uh, Janelle Wong, uh, Nadia Brown, and I became very interested in the publication of solidarity statements this past year with the Black Lives Matter movement. And we started analyzing them. We're still analyzing them. You know what we noticed? And this is very, still very preliminary, but a lot of these statements were largely symbolic. And, and, and it's not to say that symbolic politics don't matter, but very few of these statements made actual commitments to doing something. And again, it is not enough for us to have brochures that are laced with the faces of those who um, are under, underrepresented in our fields. Uh, we must make efforts to actually bring about substantive shifts and not just symbolic ones. Lastly, I want to point to the fact that we cannot neglect the social conditions under which political thought and social thought is produced and the institutions in which we work. These institutions are marked by traditions and histories of exclusion and erasure of non-dominant groups. And we know that this exclusion and this erasure is not just a physical of bodies, it is also epistemological. And there are scholars who are bringing attention to the fact that we love to use marginalized groups as research subjects while negating their efforts to examine themselves, their own groups, and their own efforts to theorize oppression and social change. So I want to come back to this argument that our field is an important battleground. Of course, it's not the only battleground for which we should engage in efforts for social change. And some folks, some colleagues of ours will say that they're not interested in engaging in this battle of diversifying our field. I think that's okay. Not everyone should be expected to want to engage in diversity work. Some folks are, are really interested in producing political thought. And that is important and substantive work that we should support. And we, I don't think we should expect everyone to be completely invested in doing this work. Um, but many are, many are very invested, more than ever, I think. And that's why I think we should embrace advocacy. That's why I think that it's not enough for our scientific societies to have large memberships. I think that our societies should invest in turning our members into organizers to encourage organizing for transformative change. And I see our societies more and more invested in doing that. I think that we can build on existing resources to create, expand, and seize opportunities for change. And I want, also want to point to, to the following. Insofar as inequality within our institutions reflects the inequality surrounding them, we must engage in collective efforts to address those inequalities, not only within our field, but also in our communities and institutions of governance. Lastly, I'll say that representational gains are not enough. We also need redistributive efforts to fund these efforts, to compensate those who are involved in them. And of course, uh, diversity is not enough. It is not enough to make representational gains if folks then are working within a hostile workplace where they don't feel comfortable, where they don't feel like they can stay, where they won't survive. So I will end it there and I'm excited to engage with those of you who have who've joined us. And I'm very, very thankful for this opportunity to share some of these thoughts. Great. Um, so given that we don't have so many people, I'm gonna 
un, I'm going to allow everyone to speak. Uh, I think it, once I do that, you can raise your hand if you want, if you have a question. Uh, so I have, I guess I'll kick it off with a question of my own. Uh, so I think I thought the talks uh, by two of you are great because uh, Myra sort of talked about the more bottom-up uh, infrastructural effort, uh, whereas you talk a bit more about this top-down, like how the people who already are on the other end have PhDs, have tenure track jobs, they can organize and, and uh, get a bigger voice. Um, for those of us who are trying to help but have you know time budget constraints or you know other budget constraints which is more important i guess i'll just put you on the on the spot here i mean obviously we'll try to help in both things but like where should we bias our effort a little bit maybe. go ahead maida yes um I, I wanted to add to that um, question because in my case i was doing this on my last year my tenure track we were applying to the, you know, for the grant and to uh, put together this this program. So um, and yes, we do have a lot of budget constraints. The program runs a lot of times, just like getting help here and there. It's not it's not a program that has a lot of money to to run it. But it's very important, um, even if new institutions that don't have the money and the economic resources to encourage this type of um, program, at least to acknowledge the work. I think this is very, very important um, because most of the time tenure or promotions are based, for example, on publication um uh or how many times you get cited and, and this type of work is work that you're not going to get acknowledged unless the university makes some effort to seek who is doing the work and 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 acknowledge the time that that will take on uh, uh for a person to do to put on the work so even just shifting the way that professors are evaluated or acknowledged by the institutions can create a huge impact because that will allow many of those that are interested in these fundamental changes that Fernando are, is, is talking to really put the work without fear of losing their jobs or without fear and or to do it without fear of not getting that tenure track and not be able to continue the work. So I think just just starting by the acknowledgement that this is part of their job and this is part of also one of the things that we're going to consider for promotion or for tenure can have a huge impact on um, on this main goal that fernando is talking this is a great question victor and i i'd like to add that i say this about activism generally but i also say it about the work that we're doing within our field when i'm asked what should we prioritize my answer is usually well i like to ask myself what am i good at like what are my skills what can i contribute to these collective efforts we need to see these efforts as collective right not as individual efforts so are you a good grant writer are you a good methods person who could perhaps share your slides share your insights train people are you a really good substantive person? You know the theory, you know the issues, you know the history. You know, we all have some kind of skill that we could contribute to these collective efforts. But in order to be able to contribute these skills, we need to be plugged in. We need to know what's happening. So I think that, you know, how do we get plugged in? We need to be part of the these infrastructures that I mentioned that are organizing the work and that can enable coordination so once they know and they identify okay this person has these really good skills that we can mobilize for these broader efforts we can then use these skills but insofar as each campus begins their own thing and they're all trying to diversify their own program but we're not coordinating across each other i think that we're our, the pace of change will continue to be as the apps task force put it glacial mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Uh, and yeah, we just help in whatever ways that's efficient for us to do so. Uh, so we have a question Q&A chat. Uh, how can we push higher education institutions to hold leadership accountable uh, to implement anti-racism work? How can they and we ensure that they're measuring this, 
how can we push for there to be consequences if it's not implemented and operationalized? Uh, this is a great question. So one thing that I did, um, I, I have a fellowship with the Union of Concerned Scientists and um, they were very generous to support an effort, this effort to collect statements from higher education institutions. Why do we collect statements? Well, because we want to hold them accountable. We need to know their stated preferences, their so-called values to then be able to say, well, you, we have you on paper saying that you stand in solidarity with these efforts to be anti-racist, right? So that's when we can ask, what is it exactly that you're doing? And in our statements, again, we saw that these were largely symbolic statements with some exceptions, of course. Um, and some folks got really defensive uh, when we try to survey them for their statements. They're like, we have a committee. We do diversity and inclusion, you know, like we have one black faculty or, you know, <laughs> we managed to recruit two black students this year, um, you know, which again, these things matter. Um, but when you speak with scholars who are underrepresented, it often uh, is upsetting to hear that, um, that there's so much of uh, there's so much work put into given the appearance of diversity and very little work uh, actually achieving it. So I think that how do we hold them institution? How do we hold them accountable? I think we can we can use their own stated values, their own stated preferences to say you said this, but now you're not following up with actual action. So uh, that's that's one that's one way. Of course, uh, there there are many important others. Um, I think that we should build on the strength and power that students are building. Uh, when we look at the history, uh, I mean, I, I love the work of, of a sociologist Fabio Rojas, who uh, uh, really uh, documented the history by which um, African American studies programs were created in the United States. How were they created? It was through organized efforts. Right, and these were mostly students uh, going out and, and asking university administrations to create these these programs, and these programs have been crucial uh, in supporting anti-racist work within uh, higher education institutions. So work with our students; they're building their own power, and it's very uh, effective, as we know uh, from 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 history. Uh, Victor, you're muted. We can't hear you. Oh, yeah. So here's another question. But before that, Kim uh, has an accolade for you guys, uh, which you can read in the Q&A. Uh, so the question from Jerry is, what of the large, what uh, is the largest constraint for international student? One, I guess, one of the largest constraint for international student is financial instability, which then turns into food and housing insecurity. There's also a myth that if an international student can attend a large institution like UCSD, they're financially well off. Have you faced this uh, obstacle? And if so, uh, how did you assist the students and work with institutions to overcome this? I mean, obviously, yeah, like the financial security is something that affects both American students and, and international students. Uh, yeah, so have you faced that scenario and what helps? Not yet. We haven't had uh, international students uh, apply to our program, um, at least not, in, not international students who did not have, um, who had not gained citizenship. Um, but we do envision this program growing. Uh, there are, of course, many challenges to, to, the, to that growth, but we're working on them. Um, this is a huge issue. I mean, I, a, lot of, a lot of federal money that we would be able to, use, that in theory we could use for these efforts, uh, is tied up because um, we can't we can't use it for international students. Um, so, in, in my opinion, I think we need to advocate uh, to change those constraints, right? Um, I I think that that is an, an, a really important target for for advocacy for our field. It is to uh, remove a lot of these constraints on using federal government money to support international students. Um, so that's that's one idea. Of course, there are many more, many, many more. Uh, but yes, it is a huge issue. 
Yeah, I'm just okay. going to add, if I might, um, in, in the case of Puerto Rico, we don't have a, a lot of international students, so our program um, haven't been able to support um, this type of student. But as we mentioned before, you know, every we have to think about these programs with um, in mind that different students have different needs. Um, but one of the things that we have emphasized a lot is to bring recently graduate students that are well aware of funding and get them together and um, share their knowledge to our MyGap students. Um, and this has helped because sometimes there's funding, sometimes there's help, but it, it gets lost in all this myriad of information. And so getting people together that can share their knowledge has been really important um, for our students that also they think that they only can apply for one type of scholarship or they think that there's just only all these big scholarships like for foundation. Um, and then we tend to forget that there's sometimes a uh, smaller scholarship. So we go back to what Fernando keeps emphasizing the importance of networks and the importance of people coming together and sharing knowledge to help others. Um, so I think in, in that case, Jerry, you know, you might want to start seeking other students that are in the same boat or students that have finished school that can help identify some of these um, different um, help and aid that they, um, they can be specific for international students. But, you know, the importance is that collaboration and, and creating that network that will be fundamental. Because otherwise, sometimes institutions, they just see students as this homogeneous body, and they will not be able to find the or fulfill the needs that um, different groups have. Yeah, so just to give a quick plug to GPS, um, I think we're changing that. Uh, we we traditionally had a formula on you know ranking or not really ranking assigning a score to some of the candidates to who apply to our master's program. So we're mainly a master's uh, granting institution. Uh, but this year, I noticed that there is now as part of the scores that we assign to students is diversity effort. Mm. So, uh, and if they get a high score on that, that will potentially push them into the scholarship category and they could potentially receive it. Emily, I don't know if you're uh, on here, if you can uh, clarify that a little bit. I just noticed it as I was going through like the China, cause I, I do the China program uh, and I just noticed this new uh, thing that's going on here. Uh, and we have certainly used it. Uh, you know, if someone is seen to have uh, done a lot uh, for diversity they get a higher score in that category and that actually pushes them into the scholarship recipient territory and that will get them funding. Um, so I think that's something new that we're doing. Uh, I don't know if Emily or someone can, can comment on that. Not to put anyone on the spot. Okay, well, anyway, <laughs> that's what I understand. And, and I think uh, other schools are doing it. We're, you know, we're doing it uh, we try to do that and then also for the faculty members we try to also uh, you know put more weighting on their services that are diversity related yeah that's certainly under discussion and that's something that you guys have talked about obviously uh, any other questions and comment i've got loads so <laughs> oh, scholarship just is one of the big things yeah that's fantastic to hear uh victor uh, on on the um, efforts to value diversity work because a lot of folks who we work with are in fact invested in that. Um, and, and the only, th I, I think that's huge. I think that's an important avenue for diversifying. And the only other thing I would say about that is that this is fantastic when folks are involved in that, but it's also, we should also value uh, those who are bringing diversity to our programs that don't necessarily want to be involved in diversity work. They actually want to be thinkers and writers and scholars or practitioners um, because they've been excluded from this. They haven't been given the opportunities to do so. And we shouldn't have the expectation that they're going to come in and that their route to get in will be that they've done diversity uh, work. Uh, so anyways, just one thought about that. 
Yeah, yeah, no, we, we, uh, yeah, we talk about this a lot and, and we, in general, we try to protect our junior faculty members and, and <laughs> quite a few from, uh, you know, Latinx group groups and you know, they choose and not choose to get involved and, and we don't really put any pressure on them. Uh, so a question on my gap. Um, so I was interested in seeing that, you know, most uh, or the majority of the people who went through your program who went on to graduate school, went directly to a PhD program. What are your thoughts in terms of like, you know, uh, maybe advising people to first go to a master's program, especially if you can get some money mm. to own up your skills before you apply to a PhD program. So a lot of our international students, they typically, they typically go through that route. Um, you know, they're international students, so they're less familiar with how the U.S. works, whatever, but they, they try to get the master's degree first, get, mm -hmm. you know, methodology skills, and then they apply to PhD programs, but, but you guys seem to approach it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the questions that we asked when we were looking at because originally it was to create a pipeline to PhD. That was when we first applied for, for money, that was our, our main goal. Um, so uh, that's why we gave a lot of emphasis when we were choosing students that they were sure they wanted to do a PhD, that they understood that uh, what academia meant and what a PhD meant. Um, so we, we took um, those students first. So there's a little bit of here self-selection bias. Um, and but with that in mind, I think we knew that, as you mentioned, um, there's a lot of skills that they were missing. Um, and that summer program was created to sort of breach a little bit that gap. Um, but I see here in our list, we have a uh, Professor Fortunato, um, Rio Fortunato, who also helped us. Um, he took a group of our students and, and took them to Texas and AM and gave them a very intensive strain, um, training on STATA. And for example, I was talking to two students that were coding for another professor and doing STATA work. Um, and if it wasn't for that, that program, um, the Fortunato um, help us um, with our student, they probably wouldn't have been able to survive for that first year in graduate, uh, graduate school. So we, we are very aware of that gap. Um, that methodological gap between our undergraduate student and the graduate student. And we hope that we can expand this program and improve it. Um, so they don't feel the need to have to go to a master if their ultimate goal is the PhD. Now, we don't discourage those students who just want to do a master degree. Um, we have students that from the beginning they say, I don't, I'm not interested in a PhD. I want to do a master's in public policy, for example or in public administration. And we were, okay, let's help you. And obviously they don't get fully funded, but we have helped them identify funding. Some of them have, for example, 50% of the tuition wave, other have found scholarship. So we have helped them, you know, identify money. So they don't have the need to get a lot of student loans. Um, mm -hmm. And because this is something else that we also have to keep in mind almost 56, 58% of our students are living under the poverty line, under the federal poverty line. So um, we, we have to acknowledge that many of these students cannot just go in debt for graduate school. Um, and especially job opportunities in the, islands are, in, in the island is very, very scarce. So we don't want them to come back and not find a good job. So we are very, we're not gonna discourage, but we're gonna help you to at least get some um, money for the masters. Um, so yeah, we were very aware of that that gap. Yeah, so we, yeah, like, you know, some master's degree programs have scholarships and mm -hmm. when we give it to people, it's very generous actually. So please sorry yeah. to apply. Uh, any Absolutely. other questions? Any questions? Well, uh, anyway, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this was really great. Uh, and let's keep in touch and uh, reach out, you know, if you need help uh, with mm -hmm. the, the sessions that you're doing for, for potential students. 
Uh, and please do urge them to apply to us if they're interested in a master's degree because um, we, we are, you know, very much trying to allocate funding to applicants from underrepresented groups. Uh, and, and as you know, we, uh, in terms of, you know, research on Latin America, uh, also sort of immigration policies in America, we, we do have some pretty cutting edge people here. And so, you know, I think it's a pretty good program for that. Absolutely, absolutely. That's great to hear, Victor. Thank you for this this um, opportunity to share some thoughts with you all, and we'll definitely encourage our students to consider your program. Great, thank you, Fernando and Myra. Yeah, and I just want to say um, to those that are here, um, if you have a student that needs mentorship and is interested in any topic that we either Fernando or I work, send it to us. Uh, we are likely to work with any student that wants to continue grad school or is doing is interested in some type of the research that we do. Um, and I hope we can continue expanding these um, um, networks of collaboration among us. Yes, we'll do, definitely. Great, thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye.